Well, I guess this leads us to a subject worth talking about, which is it's very important to talk to the, the state or the substance. Or if you don't talk to it, it won't talk to you. It follows the rules of ordinary etiquette, and it does not speak to strangers. But if you will say to it the simplest thing, like, hello? Then it will say, hello. And you say, is someone there? He says, yes, you know, ready and willing, what's up? Uh, but if you don't speak to it, it won't do that. That is, to my mind, the, the strangest property of psilocybin is this speaking in English business. I mean, LSD doesn't do that. Uh, mes ayahuasca doesn't do that. Psilocybin does for some reason. This is not my illusion. Nearly everybody who's spent time with it has commented uh, on this. Uh, on DMT, you see who you hear on the mushrooms. On the mushrooms, you almost never encounter something that you can see. You see hallucinations, but you do not see the author of the data stream that's saying, did you know? I'll bet you did know, the standard form of address. Uh, but on, on, on DMT, they come bounding out of the woodwork. Uh, the strangest things happen on DMT, the most intense, and you can remember them. Uh, DMT is not like a psychedelic drug in the sense that you're getting into the contents of your hopes, memories, fears, and dreams. It's much more like a parallel continuum. It's much more as though uh, you've broken through to some alien data space. One of the most puzzling things about DMT is it does not affect your mind. You know, it, it simply replaces the world 100% with something completely unexpected. But your relationship to that unexpected thing is not one of exaggerated fear or exaggerated uh, acceptance, as in, oh great, the world has just been replaced by elf machinery, your reaction is exactly what it would be if it happened to you without DMT. You're appalled. You say, you know, what happened? Because you don't feel your mind moving. You just see that the world has been replaced by something that you could not have even conceived of or imagined before. And these entities, these things which look like dribbling, you know, self-dribbling jeweled basketballs, uh, somebody, something that the uh, NBA might take an interest in, uh, they, uh, you see them and they present themselves to you. They use language to condense visible objects out of the air. Now, I don't know why they're doing that. I, I mean, perhaps on one level, I assume that they're trying to teach you to do that. On another level, they seem to be giving a demonstration of the fact that l reality is made of language. They're saying, you know, if you don't believe reality is made of language, here, I'll make you one. And then blibbledy blibbledy blip, and there it is. And they hand it to you to be passed around in, you know, slack-jawed amazement among the human beings. Uh, this, this technology that they possess of these objects made of gold and emerald and chalcedony and agate that are morphing themselves even as you look at them are, uh, you know, technological dream come true. I mean, the lapis as elf excrescence or something like that. And why they're there? I don't know. And, you know, many, many questions. Where are they when you're not stoned? 
You know, do they have an autonomous existence somewhere? Or do they spring into existence a microsecond before you encounter them? Are they rooted in the dynamics of your psyche? Or are they no more rooted in the dynamics of your psyche than the World Trade Center? It, it's, it's not clear. I mean, I think I mentioned at some point, just briefly, that the archetype of, of DMT is the circus. These things are clowns at one level. They're clowns. I mean, when you think of the circus, it's a very complex archetype. The circus is for children. It's a delight. But then, you know, and you take a child to a circus and there are three rings and absurd clown antics going on. But then you lift your eyes up to the top of the tent and there the lady in the tiny spangled costume is hanging by her teeth working without nets. It's about eros and death. I, I think my first awareness of eros was being three or four and, and these women in these tiny costumes spinning around and realizing, you know, if she falls, she dies. Uh, and then... Uh, Away from the center ring and all this action, there are the sideshows, the goat-faced boy, the thing in the bottle, the Siamese twins, and Fuzzy Charlie. All of that is also very DMT-like. It, it, it really is the archetype of the, of the circus. I can remember when I was a kid in this small town in Colorado, every year at the 4th of July, the carnival would come to town for a week and set up and we anticipated it throughout the year but as soon as the carnival came to town then you couldn't play outside after nine o'clock at night because carny people are different we were told and you know their uh, means of support sexual proclivities and choice of intoxicants might have run counter to this midwestern catholic mining town I was in. And so then there's this sense of the disruption, the danger, the drama, the interest, the fun, and then they go away and life is as if they had never been there at all. And that's what DMT is like. I mean, it, it's a secret of such magnitude that it's inconceivable how it has ever been kept. Because, you know, in a world where information was fairly weighted, we would spend as much time talking about DMT as we spend talking about, I don't know, the West Bank or something. And as you see, by studying our newspapers, we, DMT is rarely, if ever, mentioned. I mean, never would be a good rule of thumb. We're very, the Western mind is very queasy around these experiences that cast into doubt its cherished illusions about how reality is put together. And when you get to DMT, you have hit the main vein. I mean, I hold it in reserve as the ultimate convincer. I mean, that's for these, there are these people running around, you know, who say, oh, you people who are into drugs, <laughs> give me a good branch whiskey and a little TV. I, I, I think you're deluding yourself. Say, you, do you? Well, have you got five minutes to invest in this proposition, my cheerful friend? Because if you do, have I got news for you? It also seems to me, you know, considering the fact that DMT is a naturally occurring neurotransmitter, that you return to the baseline of consciousness in 15 minutes, that it's utterly harmless. Uh, what's the matter with our critics? Why are they so phobic of it? You know, what is it? Are you tainted forever if you know the position of your enemy? Why are they so afraid to give it a chance? Well, I think I can answer my own question. Quoting a wonderful thing Tim Leary said years ago, he said, LSD occasionally causes psychotic behavior in people who have not taken it. <laughs> right. <laughs> that is the problem, I believe, that these drugs are causing outbreaks of psychosis 
among people who won't get near them. And they are turned into frightened, paranoid order freaks reaching for, uh, you know, extra legal and extra constitutional means to make your life hell. Obviously, their minds have been severely bent by the absence of this drug. Uh, however, the knowledge of it seemed to practically undo them.